All right, everyone, this is chapter 17, Neurological Emergencies. Uh, remember when you watch this lecture, you need to be taking notes and you should be asking questions of yourself, writing down questions that you have. So you come to the Q&A sessions, uh, ready to discuss anything that you have um, that you didn't quite grasp or comprehend. Also, uh, when you're taking your D2L quizzes, make sure that if you are having a hard time with any of those questions, that you write down the question so you can email me um, email your instructor, or just come to the Q&A or Q&A sessions um, asking the questions. All right, so we have chapter 17, which is neurological emergencies. Remember that the brain um, is the master control center for our entire body. It needs a few things to be happy. It needs oxygen, it needs glucose or sugar, it needs to have a consistent temperature, and it needs to have the pH correct, and pH is controlled through electrolytes. So when those four things are all in happiness, um, we have the brain uh, functioning normally. When any one of those things gets messed up, the brain is you know, gonna have um, different deficits and cause problems throughout the body. So when we go through this, we're gonna talk about strokes and seizures primarily, but understand that there are a lot of other neurological problems that can occur with the patient and that getting a good history and assessment, if you can, um, is gonna be very important. Talk about stroke, and this is saying it's the fifth leading cause of death uh, and disability in the United States. It's actually the leading cause of disability for the geriatric population that's non-traumatic. Um, when we talk about strokes, we seem to get the kind of tunnel vision that it only happens to the geriatric population. Be aware that strokes do happen to pediatric patients as well, and there's actually a pediatric stroke foundation um, because there are that many uh, strokes with pediatric patients. So, when we talk about a stroke, what are contributing factors? Well, you have family history. That's a big contributing factor. Um, anything that is um, a risk factor for heart disease is also a risk factor for stroke and vice versa. So high cholesterol, being overweight, sedentary lifestyle, having diabetes because uh, high levels of blood sugar, it kind of wears down your blood vessels. It's an irritant to the blood vessel, it wears it down, causes it to rupture. So some of those same traits. Now some of those things you can control um, and some of those are, are outside of our grasp of control. So obviously family history and genetics we can't control, but our cholesterol levels, our uh, weight and lifestyle are one of the things that we can control. When we talk about seizures, seizures can affect um, any age. We'll talk about, we already talked about uh, with pediatric population, you know, febrile seizures. And that's one of the most common uh, causes of seizure in a pediatric patient. But seizures are a huge realm of um, underlying metabolic and uh, physical issues that occur that cause the seizure. There's lists in your book, but just understand if one of those four things is messed up, if your sugar's messed up, oxygen to the brain, glucose is messed up, or the pH is messed up, we can end up having the brain having a temper tantrum and that results in a seizure. And that's just how I kind of look at it. So anatomy and physiology review, you do need to remember that there are the parts of the brain, right? The brain stem controls our primal instincts, breathing, heart rate, right? Uh, cerebellum and the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the biggest part of our brain. And then the cerebellum, they call it the mini brain or the little, the little brain, right, when you look at it. So here's a picture. Again, we have our brain stem. This is the uh, cerebellum, it's the mini brain, and it even kind of looks like a mini brain. And then the brainstem is the primal part, connects to the spinal cord. And we have these cool little things, these pawns and some of these other things on there that control our respiratory rate and our heart rate and have those feedback receptors. All right, so the cerebellum controls your muscle and body coordination. Um, so when there's damage to the cerebellum, which is the largest part of the brain, we see deficits with body coordination. When we send messages back and forth, remember you have sensory nerves and you have motor nerves. Um, we also have cranial nerves, the 12 cranial nerves that connect to allow our face to move, talk, our tongue to work, our eyes to move, right? Those are all um, important in the way that they attach to the brain, they attach in different parts of the brain. So we can actually see and measure some levels of dysfunction in the brain um, by measuring somebody's smile or looking at somebody's gaze, looking at their pupils, um, looking to see if their tongue, when they stick their tongue out, if it goes to one side or the other. And then we have the spinal cord. You don't have to remember all the spinal nerves, 
Um, you just need to understand that the spinal cord, you know, extends all the way down, all the way to, um, you have spinal nerves that extend out past your tailbone. So when there's a deficit or damage to the spinal column, we see deficits below the level of the damage. If there's a problem with the brain, the brain will, um, if it's a systemic issue, metabolic issue with the brain, like sugar or oxygen, we see problems systemically on the body. If there's damage to a specific part of the brain, we're going to see deficits in a specific part of the body, right? That's, that's a good way to remember it. Metabolic issues are gonna be systemic issues. We're gonna see the whole body having problems like with hypoxia or low blood sugar. Um, Alter mental status. When there is damage to a specific part of the brain, like say a stroke or a seizure, we can see deficits in one part of the body, maybe. All right. So a lot of things can cause uh, brain dysfunction. Also, you need to think about traumatic brain injuries. Injuries to the brain itself um, are considered to be traumatic brain injuries, even if it wasn't from a trauma, like we know trauma, all right? But if damage to the brain occurs, that is trauma to the brain damage or to the brain tissue itself, so that is considered to be a traumatic brain injury. All right, headaches is one of the most common complaints we have um, with a neurologic type um, complaint. So don't get tunnel vision that somebody just has a headache and we seem to get the tunnel vision, they're drug seeking, all these other things. Headache can be a true complaint um, and a lot of underlying issues can be masked by a headache. It's also one of the first things that um, somebody who say is having a stroke and certain types of stroke they experience is a certain type of headache, right? So tension headaches, this is something we all get. The muscles in your neck tighten up, you know, and you get those headaches that kind of are, you can feel it starting in your neck and working its way up. Um, it's from stress, but also from, you can do it from overexerting yourself, especially your upper back. Most tension headaches we know don't require medical attention, but again, we don't, we can't see the underlying issues. So if somebody's adamant that they have a severe headache, we really have to take them to get evaluated. Migraines. So that be caused by changes in the blood vessel size in the brain. Pain is usually considered to be throbbing and pulsating when we ask our OPQRST and get them to describe the type of pain that they're having. Nausea, vomiting, and then photophobia or visual changes. The light really bothers their eyes. Um, people that have been diagnosed with migraines, there's a difference. So some people kind of generically say, oh, I'm having a migraine. Migraine is a diagnosis. So you ask them, you know, have you been diagnosed with it and what's the treatment plan for your migraines? Well, I haven't been diagnosed, so they're self-diagnosing that migraine. Make sure that you keep that in consideration, all right? People that are diagnosed with migraines, they definitely know how their migraines appear. Um, somebody that's self-diagnosing with migraines, there could be some underlying issue as well. Sinus headaches, we get those especially during allergy season. Part of your sinus is in flames, puts pressure and causes a severe headache. Now, there are times when you can get a severe sinus headache and there could be a massive amount of infection that underlies that. It hurts to touch the sinuses, the cheeks, sometimes the ear, and it radiates into the jaw. But again, when somebody's having jaw pain, we have to be careful because that can also be a sign of somebody having a cardiac event. And we have to remember the same risk factors for cardiac damage and um, damage to the heart are the risk factors for stroke as well. So headaches, all right? A headache that comes out of nowhere um, those are ones that we really need to pay attention to, especially when they're associated with uh, neurologic deficits and increased blood pressure. Those are ones we want to pay, pay close attention to, but a headache can be a sign of a lot of other things as well. So somebody that has a headache and their neck hurts to move, severely hurts to move, they're maybe running a fever, that's a sign of meningitis. We really have to do a good assessment on our patients to kind of, again, start with the big picture and start eliminating or including variables all the way down. All right, strokes. So strokes, we talked about a little bit with chapter six. It's also called a CVA or cerebral vascular accident. Um, a stroke occurs when there's damage or disruption of blood flow to tissues of the brain itself. And when those brain tissues become hypoxic or they become ischemic, then that tissue ends up dying, all right? So there's two different types of, of strokes. There's an ischemic stroke, accounts for most, the most common type of stroke. This is due to a clot or an obstruction of some sort in an embolus, all right, in the brain tissue, in the vasculature of the brain tissue that obstructs the blood flow to the distal tissues, right? We look at atherosclerosis, um, 
where you have that high cholesterol and the plaque that's building up in the brain or in any of the blood vessels. So the atherosclerosis is a contributing factor to heart disease, also to having a stroke. All right, so this is kind of a crappy picture, but it shows you where there's a big obstruction to one of the larger blood vessels coming up into the brain. So it comes up in the artery, obstructs the blood flow to the distal tissues, and then we see death of that tissue, right? Just like in the heart, when there's an obstruction to the, the blood vessels that feed the heart itself, we end up with tissue death. So time is tissue. Um, they call it brain attacks is the generic kind of thing they call it in the hospital. So they wanted to make it sound like a heart attack, so brain attack, it, it is a severe issue, okay? All right, hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke is where a blood vessel breaks in the brain tissue or in the brain. And so not only is distal circulation impaired, but that tissue around where the, the vessel broke is filling up with blood. So it can put pressure, increase the intracranial pressure, um, and that blood is also an irritant when it's outside of the, va the vascular system. So that blood being an irritant can cause a lot of damage to the brain tissue. Right. So with hemorrhagic stroke, again, some of the risk factors are the same as with uh, uh, ischemic stroke. Okay, High blood pressure is another one that we really have to be careful with. When somebody's having um, an aneurysm in the brain or hemorrhagic stroke, Sometimes they complain of a thunderclap type headache, worst headache they've ever had in their life. It comes out of nowhere um, and it just is piercing, right? Alternate uh, levels of consciousness, very common. Seizures after they've had the hemorrhagic stroke, depending on where that hemorrhagic stroke was at, also very common. Um, so getting that history can be very difficult or the onset um, of what the symptoms were when they first experienced it, if, they're alter if their mental status changed. Either way, with a stroke, um, hemorrhagic or ischemic in nature, we really need an onset time of when that occurred. So make sure that you're asking, when was the last time you saw this patient normal or, or at their normal mental status? That's very, very important because that time matters when we get to the hospital. It's a ticking clock of when they can um, treat that patient. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes on these other slides. Transient ischemic attack. So this is when a patient has the same risk factors and they're having stroke-like symptoms, but the body's natural processes um, break down the clot and the symptoms resolve within 24 hours. What does that mean for us? Well, it, it means nothing because we're going to treat it the same way. We don't know if they're having a stroke or a TIA other than assessing their symptoms and getting a good onset time. We don't have a way to assess that, so we're gonna still treat it as if it's a stroke. Again, worst case scenario, working backwards. Patients who have had a TIA, all right, about a third of them um, end up having a stroke shortly after. So it's kind of like where angina for the heart is a warning sign, a TIA is a warning sign that this, this person has all those risk factors lined up in the body to go ahead and have a stroke. So we treat it just as, as um, with the same level of haste, I should say, that we would treat somebody who's having a stroke. So signs and symptoms of a stroke, this is by no means all inclusive, and it doesn't mean if the patient could have none of these symptoms and they could still be having a stroke, right? So that's why it's hard for us to kind of um, pick and choose and determine what's going on. Doesn't matter though, right? Worst case scenario, we're gonna treat them and take them to the hospital, get good onset times. All we can do for a stroke is supportive measures. So facial drooping in one, um, sudden weakness or numbness in the face, part of the face, half the face. Um, one side of the body might be weaker than the other, right? Um, inability to control their um, motor skills on one side of the body versus another. Lack of power, so grips will be unequal. Muscle coordination and balance will be off. And then blurred vision is possible in one eye, or even both eyes sometimes. Swallowing becomes an issue. So that becomes a choking hazard or an airway issue. Decrease in altered levels of uh, responsiveness, depending on what's going on. Say if somebody's having a hemorrhagic stroke and it's a subarachnoid bleed um, into the brain, their mental status will change and go back and forth. Right? Inability to say what they mean. So um, they might be trying to get one word out or say one thing, but they can't convey that. And so a lot of frustration can be included with it. Sudden severe headache and the slurred speech. Confusion, dizziness, 
restlessness, ten, uh, tongue deviation. Combativeness comes with any sort of brain injury. It's a, a potential um, side effect of any brain injury, including hypoxia. So just be aware of that with your own safety that somebody could have that combativeness. And then a coma, which is a diagnosis, but coma just means that they're, they're unresponsive. So different parts of the brain can have different dysfunctions throughout the body. Like I said, part of the brain is having the issue, like a stroke, we're gonna see dysfunction to one part or one side of the body. Whereas if it's a metabolic issue, we'll see systemic dysfunction. So left hemisphere, um, inability to produce or understand speech. So strokes to the left side of the, of the body is the, or the left hemisphere of the brain is the speech centers, right? And how we comprehend when we speak. They may have dysfunction to the right side of the body as well. Right, right hemisphere, this person um, is having a hard time controlling like their, their tongue, um, speech can be slurred. So they might not realize they're having a stroke um, because a lot of times the right hemisphere strokes, you won't see muscle coordination dysfunction with it. Um, so people might be in denial with it um, because they're not having what they consider to be the typical signs of having a stroke. And then bleeding into the brain. So patients can have high blood pressure and that can be the one of the non, uncontrolled high blood pressure, especially in association with diabetes, can be a big risk factor to have an aneurysm anywhere in the body. And then when you think about the brain, blood vessels in the brain are so small, they can only handle a certain amount of pressure, all right? Um, if they end up with a bleeding into the brain or any of the spaces around the brain, that's significant, increases in cranial pressure. Think about when you had the head trauma um, lecture with Mod 5. Same thing, all right? We can end up with a lot of problems. So here again, it talks about the fractures, right? Things that mimic strokes. Again, we treat it supportively and take them to the hospital, okay? There's not a whole lot we can do for these patients. We have to monitor them. Look for your Cushing's triad, so watch for your pulse pressures widening out. That's a sign that there's increased in cranial pressure, especially with neurologic deficits. So just because there wasn't a trauma to their brain, you know, we still need to monitor and take those blood pressures. One blood pressure doesn't do us anything. We need to have a series of blood pressures to monitor, and we might not see them widening out, but we won't know that unless we start trending the blood pressures up. All right, seizures. So seizures come in a lot of different forms. Different people are, people have them, uh, different types of seizures. I have a video that I'm gonna show you guys with kind of talking about specifically epilepsy. Epilepsy, epilepsy is a diagnosis, it's a seizure disorder in the brain, but people can be diagnosed um, or not have a diagnosis of epilepsy and still have seizures. Again, it's the brain's way of saying, hey, something's not right. One of those four things is off in our brain. So different types of seizures. Um, we have the tonic-clonic type seizure. It's also known as a generalized seizure. So involves or can involve both hemispheres of the brain, um, unconsciousness, and then they have that generalized the twitching of the muscles. And it's, it looks pretty severe. Anytime somebody's having a seizure, um, bystanders, they're scary to watch. So I, the first time I saw a seizure, it was terrifying to watch. So when you're assessing a patient, when you come in and that's the chief complaint of a seizure, even if they're not having the seizure when you get there, and we'll talk about how the different types of assessments work, we need to ask bystanders certain things, like what was their muscle? What, what happened during the seizure? What, were they, what was their body doing? How long did that seizure last? And was there any time between seizures, right? Did they regain consciousness between seizures? Absent seizure, the motor activity doesn't change. Um, a lot of times this is where they just stare off into space. They can have an absent seizure hundreds of times during the day. They stare off into space, um, not responsive. And from there, they go and come right back to their normal level of responsiveness, okay? And it just can happen over and over again. Focal seizures. So um, patient's level of consciousness doesn't change. This is where they might have um, one part of the body. A lot of times there's a smell or a change in their taste that they have that they recognize as being part of their seizure. Sometimes they can have muscle twitching. It's not super common with focal seizures, um, but it's again, part of the whole assessment. But their level of consciousness remains the same. Again, part of our asking the questions, did their level of consciousness change? Complex partial seizures, 
This is one where they end up with altered mental status. Um, this is where they have lip smacking. They, they smack their lips, isolated jerking, right? Visual hallucinations. Um, the behavior can look weird, um, repetitive physical behavior. So it's just part of their body is just repeating the same action over and over again. Some people sometimes can um, confuse it with Tourette's. It's not Tourette's, but it, it presents similar. Then we have this thing called an aura. So when patients who um, have had multiple seizures, they might recognize that they have an aura that they experience. And that's basically like a glow around lights or glow around lighter objects. If you, the way I remember it when I was swimming um, all the time and I got out of the pool, especially in the evenings, and I look up at the light and I kind of see this like glow around the lights um, because of the chlorine in my eyes. So that was an aura, all right? And patients who have had seizures and recognize it, they'll start seeing an aura beforehand. Sometimes they recognize they start having an aura or they start having that weird smell. They'll find themselves clear their space and sit down to have their seizure um, because they know it's coming. All right, generalized seizures, sudden loss of consciousness, chaotic muscle movement tone, apnea is another big one. So irregular respirations, um, inability to swallow, so we have airway issues. These are ones that really need intervention by an ALS provider. I think EMT should be able to handle everything up to, you know, within the first five minutes of a call, complete catastrophe. But when we talk about seizures, this is one of those ones where we really need to have um, paramedic there because they can administer drugs to stop the physical manifestation of the seizures. The brain's still having its spaz out, but when you can stop the physical manifestations of the seizure, you can control things like the airway um, and make sure that they're not going to aspirate. You can also deliver assistive ventilations. The um, generalized seizure, this is one that is followed with a postictal state. A uh, postictal state is a period of unresponsiveness where a patient suddenly starts regaining consciousness, all right? It lasts about 30 minutes. So we might get there and they've, they're in the postictal state already. We monitor and we get all the information we can if there's any bystanders around. And we make sure that we're assessing our patient looking for trauma, you know, because during the seizure they could hurt themselves. Also checking blood sugar, people sometimes forget that, but blood sugar should be checked regularly um, as a patient's coming out of their prostictal state. They've just utilized so much blood sugar and the brain has utilized so much of their sugar to have that seizure. That is something we need to monitor. All right, petite mal seizures or absent seizures, these last for only a few seconds. Um, patients will come back with like a brief lapse of memory. So I tease when I'm in class because I'm sitting there going, oh, some people could be sitting here having absent seizures and not remember what is going on around them and I would never know it until we go to take a test, right? Absence seizures usually go undiagnosed. Um, strangely enough, they find them when they do sleep studies on patients. So uh, they'll go in and especially if they're doing the sleep study and they're monitoring their brain activity, this is where they notice that they have the absence seizures. Status epilepticus, it's kind of fun to say, um, but it's one of those really emergent situations. It's when a patient's having seizures so frequently that their body can't recover from it again, especially that periods of apnea and their blood sugar, and they're having them so frequently without it stopping, right? So that is something that we have to be really aware of when we're getting the history. If they're still having a seizure when we get on scene, that's a bad thing, all right? Because seizures shouldn't last, you know, two to three minutes, maybe, maybe five minutes. Our average response time is eight minutes or less. If they're still having the seizure when we get on scene, we need to keep that in consideration because a lot of time has passed, all right? Um, or if they're having the repeated seizures when we get on scene. So causes, causes of seizures, and this is by no means all inclusive, congenital issues, structures to the um, brain, all right? So you can have congenital issues where it's inherited, structural issues, damage to the brain from birth, damage to the brain after they've had an accident, those sorts of things can cause um, a seizure issue. Metabolic disorders, remember I told you, you know, not enough oxygen, sugar screwed up, electrolytes are screwed up, their temperature, their body temperature, they've been exposed to the heat too long, all right? That's something the brain doesn't tolerate very well, which leads us to the febrile seizures. And that comes usually with pediatric patients that have that sudden spike in their temperature, in their body temperature. 
And then epileptic seizures. Um, epilepsy is one of those things, it's a diagnosis. Uh, patients are put on medications to control their seizures. And when they have epilepsy, um, they're gonna be on medication for their entire life. We tend to see a lot of non-compliant teenagers um, with their medications because for whatever reason, they decide they don't wanna be on medicine anymore and they can end up having breakthrough seizures. Same thing, their body, if it's not metabolizing the medicine because they were sick or because they took it at the wrong times of days or the wrong time of day, they can end up having a breakthrough seizure as well. Somebody who has a diagnosis of epilepsy and is having breakthrough seizures might not need to be transported to the hospital. As long as they're coming out of the seizure and they have somebody to stay with them, they can refuse treatment or they can refuse transport to the hospital. Again, it has to be documented. So you can go through and look at the different tables and talk about, you know, think about the different types of seizures and the causes of different types of seizures. Um, but this is by no means all-inclusive. One that I want you to pay attention to, again, is metabolic. So poisoning, drug overdoses, withdrawals from certain medications and alcohol, and then blood chemical values. So uh, basically the electrolytes screw stuff up. Hypoglycemia is low blood sugar, all right? we'll see the problem present systemically. So recognizing when a seizure is occurring is a big deal. Um, and then other problems that can be associated with the seizure or can be a result of it. Somebody that's smacking their head around on the concrete when they're having a seizure. Somebody hasn't been protecting their head. Airway issues, aspiration issues. Those are all um, associated problems as a result of the seizure. Postictal state. So I already talked about it a little bit, but the postictal state is when somebody's had that generalized seizure and they end up with a period of unresponsiveness where they slowly start coming around, okay? We monitor that postictal state very carefully, especially the airway and their uh, ventilations. Blow by oxygen, if that's the best you can do, you wanna get them on some oxygen, all right? Control the variables that you can. And be very, very, very aware of the fact that aspiration and choking can occur. Um, in the postictal state. All right, syncope. So syncope is the body's way of hitting the reset button. Um, so let me, one second. I wanted to find a bottle, but I don't have a bottle sitting around here. So think about a water bottle and the cap is your brain, okay? When your brain isn't getting everything it needs, your body hits the reset button, all right? and you have a syncopal episode or you faint, all right? It's easier to perfuse the brain when we're laid down. That's just kind of like, it's just like hitting control, alt, delete on your computer, okay? So it's different than having a seizure, right? Now, people can get dizzy and faint, they can get tunnel vision and faint. It's important to get a good history on these patients, especially what was occurring right before they had that syncopal or near syncopal episode, what was going on. There are so many causes of a syncopal episode. Um, it could be because the blood pressure dropped too low. It can be because they're dehydrated. Their heart could have an arrhythmia. Sometimes people have a syncopal episode because they see things that are, are disturbing visually. So because they've had a syncopal episode does not mean that we don't assess them. Okay, we can't say, oh, they just passed out and fainted. We need to kind of look for the underlying cause because the underlying cause could be a life threat and it could be a real life threat if we don't catch it. So assessing your patient that's had a syncopal episode is really important in getting a good history of present illness, right, with what's going on. And then again, if they have a syncopal episode, did they fall all the way down? Sometimes people don't go all the way horizontal, right, depending on their position and where, if they're sitting up or whatever, they might not pass all the way out. So the body wasn't able to completely reset at that point either. Altered mental status. So you can have a number of causes of altered mental status. You'll see it um, abbreviated as AMS um, throughout the course. Just be aware that altered mental status is something that's differing from their baseline mental status. We go with the normal baseline, which is alert and oriented times four with a GCS of 15. Anything that's different from that, we have to explain, right? that's considered to be an altered mental status. Now, some patients have, um, like with dementia, they end up having an altered mental status as their baseline, but it can be um, exacerbated by 
events going on around them, having some sort of neurologic emergency or a stroke. So it's important to ask what this patient's um, normal baseline is. Other causes of altered mental status, hypoglycemia. So the blood sugar in the body becomes so low that they become unresponsive or their mental status decreases. Think about it, you don't have to have diabetes, right? We all get that hangry feeling um, when we start, we haven't eaten and uh, we start feeling lightheaded, maybe you're, you get tired. Um, if we let our blood sugar drop even lower, that becomes an altered mental status and it's true emergency. Our brain needs to have the sugar to survive. Delirium is an acute issue versus a chronic, right? So delirium is something that is symptomatic of other issues going on. Patients can have delirium um, from having an infection, having a fever. Um, patients that are, are in the hospital, especially patients that are in the hospital for a long period of time, have something called sundowners, where they, they end up having um, an acute delirium because they don't know where they are, and it happens in the evenings especially. So if you can fix the underlying issue, the delirium will um, subside, right? But we need to identify what the underlying issue is. We not necessarily, we take them to the hospital, they can under, identify what the underlying issue is. But any patient, when we start our primary assessment, if they have an altered level of consciousness, right then and there is where we should be getting a blood sugar. Because while they're still conscious, it's easy for us as EMTs to treat a low blood sugar. It's when they become unresponsive, we can't treat it anymore. That becomes a higher level of care. It's outside of our scope. All right, other causes of altered mental status, head injuries, maybe head injuries that weren't recognized. Remember, as we get older, our brain sh uh, shrinks in size. So a head injury, a head trauma, even from bumping your head on the car door when you're getting in or the, um, you know, on the, the hood of the car, or the roof of the car, when you get in the car, when we get older, it can cause a, a bleed to occur inside the brain that might not um, manifest itself for some time, all right? Intoxication, we know, can cause altered mental status, and not every drunk is a happy drunk. Uh, psychological disorders, medication complications, uh, opiate complications, certain um, types of actually seizure medications can cause altered mental status, and psychiatric medications can also do that. And then infections. So infections that involve the blood or the brain itself, um, or an infection that spreads systemically can cause altered mental status. So our size up for any neurologic emergency is obviously our scene size up, looking around, um, paying attention to any clues that you find. Primary assessment, general impression, is it good or bad? Level of consciousness, altered mental status, immediately take a blood sugar on these patients, all right? And then the book talks about making sure altered mental status also is put on oxygen. So oxygenation is important because we can control the hypoxia in our patient, making sure they have adequate tidal volumes controlling the variables we can control, right? Getting a good history if you can, and history doesn't just mean talking to bystanders or the patient. It's looking for clues, looking for medications, looking to see if they have any emergency alert, um, you know, like they have a seizure disorder. People are now putting tattoos on their wrists that they have epilepsy or diabetes. Um, so looking for any clue that could help us um, figure out what's going on with this patient at the time. Making sure your airway is always clear. Um, making sure that you have the proper ventilations. Hyperventilating your patient doesn't help, right? So making sure that you have adequate tidal volume and that you are having adequate oxygenation. Secondary assessment, vital signs. One set of vital signs is worthless. Make sure you're getting, trending your vital signs, okay? Um, and then watching for that Cushing's triad, the widening pulse pressures. In the acute setting, when it's just happened, we might not see the widening pulse pressures. That might be something that comes later on, um, unless there is just a massive amount of bleeding in their brain. So it's important to watch, all right? I hope it didn't skip. Look for your pupil size. That tells us that's a window to our brain. So pupils make a big deal, or make a big difference. Um, assessing your pupils and then documenting. Now you can have equal pupils, but they could be sluggish to respond that's still pertinent finding. Secondary assessment is the Cincinnati stroke uh, scale. That's the one that we use the most commonly in Tacoma scale. So Cincinnati stroke scale is in your book. Um, it's hard to do it while I am sitting here, but uh, when you guys are reviewing or we're doing the live in person reviews, we need to go over the Cincinnati stroke scale. And then Glasgow coma scale is a big one. 
So make sure that you are knowing your Glasgow Coma Scale. That's going to hit you in the test. All right. So Cincinnati right here, it's a test for facial droop, arm drift, and speech. So when you have a patient smile, it needs to be symmetrical on both sides. All right. Um, you have them sit down. Don't have them doing the Cincinnati Stroke Scale while they're standing. But while they're sitting, have them put both of their arms out and then close their eyes. Okay. When we have our eyes open, we, we kind of consciously keep our, eye, our arms at the same level. You close your eyes, though, we look for arm drift, right? And then they talk about speech. So, you know, the sky is blue in Cincinnati. You have them say anything that is consonant heavy, right? If they're slurring of their speech, that is a considered a positive finding, um, especially in conjunction with the other things on the Cincinnati stroke scale. All right, Los Angeles stroke scale, it depends on your agency, what you're gonna use. Cincinnati stroke scale seems to be the standard of care, but when you look at the, the Los Angeles one, um, they basically look at your blood sugar, which I think is very, very pertinent. Um, and then it also does the facial, um, you know, smile, and then looking at their arm like strength, all right? Ask out coma scale, memorize it, learn it, love it. It's important, all right? Um, they get posturing. They're pulling things towards their core. They're holding on to life. Abnormal extension is just life, okay? Both of those posturings are symptomatic of brain dysfunction, severe brain dysfunction. All right, what they need to do. So um, getting an onset time, making sure you're taking them to an appropriate facility, and then notifying that facility. 